greatly, not only because we just weren't able to be with you, uh, but also given our circumstances, we uh, certainly got uh, a deeper taste and appreciation of uh, really how blessed uh, we are uh, to live in the country that we live in and uh, be able to uh, worship God freely uh, like we are able. Let's go to Acts chapter 17. Uh, we're going to just uh, highlight a few um, takeaways from our trip uh, into Southeast Asia. Uh, hope that you all can uh, gain uh, benefit from this as uh, we learn uh, some insights regarding the uh, culture and the religious environment and also uh, have some uh, news or uh, information to report uh, from the work of our brethren in that area and in that region. And uh, maybe that's something you would like to take an interest in uh, individually, or maybe as a family you'd like to take interest in it, or maybe even as a congregation it's something we want to look into uh, because there are uh, lots of challenges while at the same time lots of opportunities in this region. Uh, so let's look at Acts chapter 17. And um, let's, uh, if someone can read for me verses 22, uh, 22 through 28, 22 through 28. <coughs> Actually, all the way through uh, 29, if you would. 22 through 29 of Acts 17. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an open of this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, nor is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. Okay, so we're removed in a lot of ways from <laughs> what Paul is dealing with here uh, in Athens. Um, we're removed in a lot of ways of what takes place in other parts of the world regarding idolatry. I mean, it's here, don't misunderstand me, but it's not all around us. And uh, I can tell you that what Hannah and I um, were surrounded around uh, for nearly two weeks now um, in this part of the world, Southeast Asia, idolatry is everywhere. I mean, that's just, that is the way of life. Um, it is all over the place. Um, we went to uh, Seoul, South Korea, uh, and then we went to, and we were just in the airport in Seoul, and then we went to Vietnam, uh, went to Singapore, and went to Thailand. And uh, two out of three of these pictures are pictures that we ourselves took. Uh, so Vietnam, uh, that is actually in uh, the uh, bus driver's window of our um, bus. I'm looking for the laser pointer. I thought it was back here. Maybe it's somewhere else. That's all right. Uh, you can read, I would imagine, hopefully. It's big enough. Vietnam, the far left there, um, and that's very common. We've even talked about here in this area uh, as more and more folks from the uh, Asian regions move into uh, Alpharetta in the coming area. We see them in their cars a lot of times having these types of gods, um, little g gods, idolatrous gods, in their cars, and that's very common. A lot of our tour guides, a lot of our buses, um, even the boat. I mean, we, we were on a boat for a little while, um, a little transporter boat. I mean, it wasn't even really fully enclosed. And uh, the boat driver had all these uh, idols set up right in front of his boat. Very, very common. It's everywhere. Uh, and in Singapore, uh, this is actually in the Little India region of Singapore. And uh, there is a, a high influence of Hinduism which is uh, the common religion in the Indian uh, region and part of the world. Uh, Singapore is a very interesting place. It is uh, made up of about 70% Chinese, uh, and then the rest, majority, are uh, Malaysians, or Malay as they call them, 
uh, which is very similar to Chinese as well, and Indians. That's generally the demographic of the Singapore region. And then they have what they call others, which is generally uh, European folks and American folks uh, and other parts of the world, but mainly them uh, coming into that region to work. So it's, it's very much a mixed pot kind of culture, uh, but idolatry is still very, very strong. And so here's a, a taste of Hinduism, uh, and we'll look at some other pictures in just a moment. And then Thailand, we did not take this picture, uh, but we'll show a picture in just a little while uh, of how really big this Buddha is um, in uh, Thailand. This is on the island of Koh Samui. And when you're flying in, you can actually see, I mean, it's huge. Uh, there's actually a few of them, uh, but it is a, a ginormous um, uh, idol god. Uh, and, and this is kind of just a little taste and flavor as we get into this. Um, but let's talk a little bit about Vietnam, and let's think also at the same time of what Paul is dealing with in Acts 17. So we just read a moment ago that these folks in Athens, they were more of the philosophical type, but indeed they're engaged in idolatry. <clears throat> and they're trying to cover all their bases in Acts 17. How do we know that? One of the gods, little g, is an unknown god. Hey, just in case we're missing something here, uh, let's make sure we, we fill in all the blanks. So this is the unknown god. And Paul uses that as an opportunity and open door to say, hey, listen, this is... Uh, the God, big G God, that you don't know uh, clearly, and him I'm going to declare unto you. Uh, he's not to be worshipped uh, in a temple because he's God. He created all things. Uh, and he himself is not made by man's hands, but actually made us uh, in his image. And that is a far cry of a difference as to the world of idolatry. Idolatry, the mindset is, I'm going to make this God. In Hinduism, for example, there's over 300 million, uh, just an astronomical amount. Um, and really, it could be at any point in time, you just make one. Um, and this is going to be my God, and it symbolizes um, a, a certain power over a certain area of life. Uh, I'm going to pray to this God for these reasons and for these purposes. And all of those details matter. Because uh, it has influenced other areas of, quote, Christendom, the academic term for uh, folks that uh, claim to follow uh, biblical teachings. Uh, there are denominational bodies who have picked up on these idolatrous practices and these, quote, Eastern Asian type religious uh, uh, systems and have basically taken certain pieces of them and said, well, uh, we're going to do something similar, but we're going to do it in a way that's according to biblical principles rather than according to these Eastern Asian uh, religious principles. So rather than praying to all these uh, gods and, uh, you know, for certain areas of life, you're going to pray to certain uh, maybe heads or prominent figures within, quote, uh, this denominational body uh, and the history that these folks have uh, brought about, uh, they're going to represent um, a certain area of life, say, uh, trying to find certain things, trying to find good health, uh, trying to uh, find prosperity, whatever it is. You're going you're gonna to pray to this certain figure uh, in order to access that. So it, it's mirrored in a lot of ways. And you're going to see that here in just a second as we walk through this. Vietnam uh, had a lot of uh, Buddhism and also a lot of ancestry worship, okay? And here's probably the biggest takeaway uh, from, from our experience over there. There's no clear paradigm, okay? There's no just very orthodox, ordered system as to how things are done. And not only from a religious perspective, but from an economic perspective, from a political perspective, and you could even say maybe the reason why economically and politically, etc., socially, there's a lack of order. Maybe it's because it has started with their religious way of doing things. There's not a clear answer um, that, that really exists uh, necessarily. Um, you're going to find a whole bunch of inconsistencies and a whole bunch of different ideas. And so Buddhism is not clearly this in all cases generally accepted, this is the authority, this is the answer, here's what we can know for sure. 
Uh, ancestry worship is over here. This is what we know for sure. It kind of, in a lot of ways and in a lot of cases, blends together. Uh, and each one is kind of uh, mirroring and picking off little pieces of another to kind of create their own <laughs> religious um, approach. Uh, and for example, we'll get to Singapore in a second, but Hannah and I actually were given a ride home uh, by Brother Peter Chin and his wife. Uh, Brother Peter Chin is a member at the uh, Lim Ha Pin Road Congregation in Singapore. Um, and we'll show some pictures in just a moment. Uh, and also is the director at the Four Seas Bible College, um, where uh, preachers are being trained to go out into the, these regions. And uh, he said, you know, his upbringing consisted of a little bit of Taoism, a little, little bit of Buddhism, and a little bit of uh, ancestry worship. Uh, I think he, Hannah might remember, I think he even mentioned a few more. I mean, it was kind of this blend. Uh, and in a lot of ways, that's how things are done. Um, well, when we look at uh, other denominational systems, uh, in a lot of ways, it could be said that the effort to win over these people, um, there were a lot of attempts to uh, mirror or copy what they were used to doing and then translating it over into Christianity. Okay, so for example... Over here on the left picture, you see some, uh, you see some uh, uh, moldings and some, some um, images here. Uh, at the bottom, you can't really see, but those are dragons. And dragons are one of the seven, quote, holy animals uh, in, in uh, Vietnam and in, in Buddhism. Um, and so they are highly regarded and are, are worshipped. Uh, you also see there, probably, I believe, the picture with the dark, um, can you tell me if you can see it, but the, the darker uh, image there, um, the darker statue, is a woman-type version of Buddha. Um, someone that was a woman in the, uh, the Buddhist system uh, who is highly regarded and, uh, again, uh, worshipped and revered. Uh, and then Next to that, the lighter statues. Can anyone guess what those are? Virgin Mary. That's right. It is. Uh, and and uh, a cross is being held, which you can't see, but you would know that for sure if you could zoom in. Um, and so are you seeing a little bit of, of how things have been mirrored in certain ways? Look also uh, here in this middle picture. This is a lady who is outside of... Um, a, and by the way, we'll get into this in a second too, uh, Vietnam, the Lord's people uh, have, have not been allowed or authorized by the government to assemble uh, in, in Vietnam. Uh, the northern part is still very heavily communist, um, meaning the people there are actually still very much, um, they, they pledge their allegiance and live uh, very faithfully to the communist way of life and ideals. The people in the South are less so that way, which kind of parallels to our war situation long ago. Um, so uh, in, in certain ways, the South has attempted to uh, you know, kind of free itself, but the government still is ultimately being run out of Hanoi in the North, and so it still uh, finds out about things. And brethren uh, of, of um, the Ho Chi Minh City area at one time were worshiping uh, and were raided on by the government and were put in prison, put in jail. Uh, and the ones who were not captured ended up dispersing. And there are a few small congregations now, mainly even deeper south from Ho Chi Minh um, in the Mekong Delta region where uh, brethren are still meeting and assembling. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we get to Singapore, and I'll show you why. But there are denominational bodies that are uh, authorized. Uh, for example, the Catholic Church, um, in its growth period, uh, especially uh, in Asia, um, was already well established in Vietnam. And there are even a lot of cultural signs and evidences of certain uh, cultures that just don't fit or make sense in Vietnam. 
Take, for example, French. Uh, if you go through the streets in Vietnam, you're walking, and you're thinking in your mind, Asia, 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 and then all of a sudden it's like, wait a second, is this New Orleans? Is this Paris? What is this? I'm confused. Uh, and it's because the French uh, at one time had a heavy influence uh, in the Vietnam uh, region. And a lot of these countries, Vietnam definitely being one of them, there's a lack of uh, coherent self-governance and control uh, that historically has existed with these countries. Vietnam has had issues where China's ruled them, uh, France has ruled over them. I mean, just constantly kind of in and out and, and never really establishing themselves uh, to really be a stronghold uh, in their own way of governance, etc. Even now, uh, Hanoi, for example, is still very much um, willing to align itself with, with China. Uh, that's more of the northern part of Vietnam, the communist area, versus the south is very much opposed to that. The south is in no way happy about China uh, and wants to kind of break free from that whole cycle. Uh, so um, there are certain elements within Vietnam where it's kind of like this is out of nowhere, but what happened was for a certain period of time, uh, there was a certain ruling way and a certain system that existed and it was established enough to kind of plant its roots there, and it just never fully dissipated. And so that's true with the Catholic Church, for example, uh, where they have the religious rights to be able to worship in freedom. They've got, gained access to that via the government. But in other cases, uh, that's not true. I mean, if you wanted to just assemble and begin assembling to study the Bible and to begin uh, uh, worshiping, you're not allowed to just do that. Uh, even a certain party of people that want to assemble, um, what the government is concerned about, even if it's not necessarily for religious reasons, the government's concerned about these free assemblies because what do you think they think is going to happen? Revolution. A revolution against the Communist Party and against the government. So they're not looking at it as we want to squash religion. I mean, they don't view it that way. That is ultimately what they're doing. They're not allowing the Bible to have free course. They're looking at it as... We want to remain in power. Uh, and so, obviously, there's been some things that have been worked out where that has been allowed for some, uh, but others it's just simply not allowed. Uh, and so what you're seeing here is on the uh, kind of the, the front entrance of a, uh, of a Catholic church, and this lady is selling. What do you see there at the bottom? Uh, those, are, those are Mary, and there's also other images, other statues, uh, within the Catholic religion, there's saints, um, there's, you know, and not saints, what we know as saints in the Bible, sanctified people of God, those who are Christians, but those who have been uh, exalted and uh, who are put on a pedestal uh, by the Catholic Church. And so uh, you think about the Catholic way of doing things, praying to saints, uh, certain saints representing certain things, for example. And what do you see here on the far right picture? Rosary beads. Rosary beads, which, where do prayer beads come from? Eastern religions, these Asian religions. I mean, so you see kind of the blending of how all this kind of got mixed together, where we read in the Bible nothing of prayer beads, nothing of a rosary bead, nothing of saints or uh, certain Christians being uh, exalted uh, to any type of um, uh, hierarchical uh, pedestal. As a matter of fact, uh, the only cases where this, this was even attempted, what occurred in response to it? The people who were doing it were rebuked. Uh, go with me to Acts chapter 10 for just a second. Acts chapter 10, and if someone could read for me 23 through 26. <coughs> Acts chapter 10, 23 through 26. Then Kyle he sent in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied them. And the morrow, after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and dear friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. 
But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. So let me ask you a question. Was Peter uh, accepting of this worship and of this uh, exaltation? No. No, not at all. And so, um, you know, where did these ideas originate from? Well, let me ask you this. What have our brethren attempted to do uh, in Texas, for example, in their efforts to um, win the lost? What do they do with the scriptures? What do they do with God's will? They try to loosen it. They try to say uh, their literal explana explanation um, I'm thinking about the uh, congregation in, um, oh, is it Fort Wayne? It's not Fort Wayne. It's the other fort in Texas. Um, Fort Worth. Fort Worth. Thank you. Dallas, Fort Worth. It's, it's two big cities right there next to each other. Um, our, our brethren over there said, well, yeah, we're going to begin to leave uh, God's pattern for worship because we want to do what? Save the lost. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Let's leave what God says so that we can save the lost. What are we doing to ourselves when we do that? Lost. Being lost. Yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense. And so, uh, it, 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 you know, and side note for just a second, I had a conversation with one of my professors, actually. He was asking questions um, about the Lord's church. And we, I mean, he actually, we had one conversation at dinner, um, and that kind of veered off. And, and then later in the trip, he actually came up to me privately and started asking me more questions. Um, and I was very excited about that, and I, I hope our studies will actually continue. But he was asking me some questions of things that he had heard of regarding uh, the churches of Christ. And uh, I, I, I told him very plainly that uh, the Lord's church is autonomous, and um, you know other congregations may do other things, and things you may bring up, that may indeed uh, have happened. But at the end of the day, denominationalism, error eventually, came out of the Lord's people. Unfortunately, it's very sad. In Acts chapter 2, when the church was established, uh, no one needed to say, well, guess what? I'm a Catholic. Well, guess, guess what? I'm a Methodist. I'm a Baptist. It was one body. And all those people knew exactly what they were doing. They were becoming members of Christ's church. That's it. But over time, error came in, and denominationalism began to be formed, uh, and so things started going astray. Um, and... You know, when we think about uh, how error is started, uh, it is even now today still starting in certain congregations of the Lord's people. Where brethren decide we're going to loosen God's commands because we want to save the lost. Okay, uh, go ahead and number one, you're already uh, loosening what God has not loosed. Uh, you're already taking away uh, from God's word, which we're clearly forbidden uh, to do throughout scripture. Uh, Revelation tw chapter 22, for example. Uh, but what generally happens once they begin to loose in one area? Uh, all of it. They, the next thing you know, 10 years later, our brethren who at one time loosed in this one little area and said, well, it's because we're trying to save the lost. 10 years later, what is it? The name is off the sign. It's the happy fellowship. We like to shake hands and give hugs, church. And it's, hey, we don't care about anything. And just as long as you're happy and smiling, we're happy for you too. And it's like, what in the world happened? Well, they deviated from God's law in one area. And next thing you know, it opens up. And it's in all areas. Uh, and so when we think about certain practices and we see what took place in Asia uh, and in, in other denominational bodies and their attempts to grow, uh, we don't need to look at this and just, you know, point the finger and say, uh, well, denominationalists, you know, how could you be doing this? The reality is, unfortunately, some of our very own brethren are in the act of doing these kinds of things, and that's why we ourselves uh, need to be mindful of it uh, also. All right, let's talk a little bit about Singapore. So here on the left, you have um, what looks to be ancestry worship. Uh, again, there's no clear paradigm necessarily, so it's, it's hard to kind of differentiate. Uh, but it's, it's clear that these figures are not um, uh, Buddha or, or Hindu-like figures. Uh, it, it's, it's possible also it could be Confucianism, it could be Taoism, I mean, it could be other things, but uh, this was uh, on display at one point uh, while Hannah and I were walking through the streets. I think she actually saw it. 
Uh, so we took a picture there. The middle picture, uh, I have a video of this and I really tried to get it to work on the computer. I, I couldn't get it to work. We went into a Buddha temple uh, in the China region of Singapore and the folks there are literally repeating things over and over and over. And, I mean, literally. And there's just a hall of people. And I don't know what they were saying, but it was literally something along the lines of habada, 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 over and over and over and over. And just, over, and just bowing like this, just constantly, just doing over and over and over. Um, and I, I really wanted to show you the video because you can see the gold uh, sculptures, the size of these sculptures. Um, uh, here, here's uh, a sign that was in the building. Um, it says, if a devout person hears the name of the present Buddha with reverence, he will be protected from all evils, accumulate immense merit, accomplish the way of the uh, Bodhis Bodhisattva, and gain knowledge of the past, present, and future. Moreover, he will possess complete sense faculties and be in the presence of all Buddhas, thereby swiftly attaining peerless enlightenment. Um, so it's very possible that what these folks are saying is Buddha, to a degree, maybe in the different names or something along those lines, uh, trying to give the people that are entering these things. Um, but this gentleman here in the, in the center picture is doing what a lot of people were doing. Folks were lighting incense uh, as they were uh, offering up uh, prayers uh, to Buddha. Uh, what he is actually bowing toward is either a dragon or a Buddha. So there's dragons throughout the hall, and there's also Buddhas. Um, if you can see the small archways, both in what he's bowing toward, there's small archways, but then there's also archways all the way down here. There's actually little Buddhas in all of those. I mean, the whole hall, far away, kind of looks like a painting. painting. You start getting up close, and there's actual statues of little Buddhas all throughout this temple. Uh, the fourth floor had, um, I can't remember the size that he mentioned, but it's an all gold Buddha. And to go up there, you have to take off your shoes and do these ritualistic things. And so we, we didn't actually go up there uh, or go into the uh, area. Um, but folks are all in these halls. They're lighting incense. They're praying. They're bowing down um, and uh, worshiping uh, uh, Buddha. Um, a couple other um, signs that we saw. Let's see. So a personal guardian deity based on the zodiac sign. The practice of selecting a personal guardian deity based on one zodiac sign originated from Fa Yan Zhu Lin a collection of teachings in the Chinese Buddhist canon. Every animal sign has a corresponding Buddha or Buddha, uh, Buddhistava who has a special link with persons born under that particular sign and offers spiritual guidance and protection to them. As such, you can choose your personal guardian deity based on your birth year's zodiac sign. Like the Buddha, our personal guardian deity serves as a source of solace spiritual support, and inspiration. Does this sound like anything familiar? <laughs> Astrolo astrological, yes, signs, absolutely. Uh, again, a little bit of Catholicism uh, exists uh, based on, on this foundation as well. Uh, however, even if we have a personal guardian deity, we have to actively work on purifying our negative ten tendencies and increase our store of merit and wisdom. This strengthens our connection to our guardian deity and speeds our progress on the spiritual path. Uh, and there's just little small, uh, I guess, either they're the guardians or Buddhas all throughout this area um, where this sign was. And so then the last picture here is the Hindu temple, uh, which there was another, you know, kind of blown up picture on that first page. Uh, this is where you see the millions upon millions, um, not obviously in this temple, but the whole religion as a whole represented via this temple of idolatrous gods. Um, this was closed to the public. 
Uh, I believe unless you paid, I think you had to pay a certain fee and you had to get a ticket and then you had to do several things as well to kind of cleanse yourself to be able to go in, uh, which the Buddhist temple was not that way. Um, at least not the base floor. The fourth floor was a little bit, but not the uh, whole temple. But Hinduism was a little different. Um, it doesn't seem as prevalent in Singapore, uh, Hinduism. Uh, and that's probably just because the Indian um, demographic is of a smaller uh, significance in Singapore as compared to the Chinese uh, and the Malays. Um, so that's uh, a little bit about Singapore. Let's go to Thailand. So here's that picture I was referring to earlier. The Buddha with all the arms, you might remember from the first page, is there on the right. And then that's actually like a ginormous Buddha on the left. You, probably to you, it's just like a yellow rectangle. Um, and this is from the plane. And you can see it. And it's you know a, a huge kind of landmark. Uh, the Thailand people are also very uh, much um, respectful of their government. It's one of the few governments that are still in power and in place where it is based upon a monarch. And the monarch is, in a lot of ways, uh, viewed as uh, deity. Uh, there is a, a semi-devotion uh, slash deity viewpoint of those that are in monarchy. So you can imagine why the folks that are in this monarchy line probably don't want to give this up. <laughs> I mean, it, even though so many of their neighbors uh, and others around the world have left kind of that system of governance, um, they have it pretty well off uh, compared to maybe your average politician who has to go out and run for re-election. Uh, in the center si uh, picture, what you're looking at there is a billboard. I know it's a very poor image, um, but when you're coming into the airport, you're leaving, um, or you can actually spot it from the runway. By the way, you just land and you get out. Get out. It's one of those runways. Uh, you're you're on the actual uh, tarmac. Um, but you can see this from that tarmac, and it says, "In remembrance of His Majesty King," and I can't pronounce his name, but he had just recently passed uh, toward the end of last year. And his son, at first they weren't sure if the monarchy was going to continue because he didn't claim the throne. Uh, and then he said he was mourning. And then eventually, I think in December, I think the father died in around October, I think then in December, he said he would at some point in the future choose to reign, but he was still mourning. And the government basically retroactively said, well, he's beginning his reign immediately upon the death of his father. So uh, interesting to think about regarding uh, governments and, and the change of power. Apparently he doesn't, I don't think, have any sons. Uh, so I think there's also still questions as to whether or not it will continue even after him uh, based upon his situation. And I don't think he's married. He's been married and divorced multiple times, I think three times, and I don't think he's presently married now. Uh, and on the right, what you see there is, is literally a, uh, a place of, of reverence toward the king who had passed. Uh, and the people there are, are very much um, a reverential people. I mean, just in general. Uh, literally, when they greet you or greet anybody, they, they walk up and they, and this was different. I mean, Singapore, this was not this way, and Vietnam was not this way. But in Thailand, they walk up. I mean, every time they see you, uh, to, to greet you. So um, they have a great respect for their government and, uh, and uh, hold their religion, Buddhism, in high regard. And uh, the king is, in a lot of ways, uh, viewed as the head of Buddhism uh, for Thailand. So it's kind of that merging uh, of, again, their idolatrous practices and the king himself being uh, deified, if you will, and uh, also being uh, head of the state. So you can see why, again, why it's maybe difficult for uh, things to change uh, over there. Um, it's very deeply rooted within that culture. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the Lord's people in this region. Uh, in Thailand, there is um, the Lord's Church is present, but it's more on the mainland, uh, the Bangkok light area. Um, in Koh Samui, there was not a congregation, however, and I don't know the reason why, uh, but there was not one that we could find. Um, Vietnam, 
there was a congregation at one time, as we had already mentioned, um, and then smaller dispersed congregations, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, it was so wonderful when Hannah and I walked. Uh, by the way, Singapore is about 6 million people on about 700 square miles. It's jam-packed. Uh, it's a very interesting place. And we, we took uh, an Uber to get some food and then walked the rest of the way to the building. And it's, it's so interesting, being surrounded by all this idolatry and you know, just having worshipped by ourselves in Vietnam, uh, just Hannah and I, uh, Sunday, uh, and, and not being able to assemble with brethren because there weren't any. Um, it was so comforting to be able to uh, walk up uh, into uh, a midweek Bible class in Singapore. They had theirs Thursday evening around 7.45. And uh, it was fascinating, as you can see with the right picture, packed, packed for midweek study. Uh, and the folks that are in front of us as we're walking, Asian families walking up, um, and it was just very encouraging to, to be able to assemble with the brethren there. And uh, these folks are very hardworking people in Singapore. Singapore is a very interesting place. Uh, the tax rate is about 21%. Pop, pop. Um, welfare does not exist. Uh, homelessness, according to the government, only exists because people uh, insist upon being homeless. Uh, if you want welfare because you are out of a job, the government uh, will guide you into uh, certain private, and they have a name for it, I can't remember what it is, uh, welfare organizations. But these welfare organizations require you to work. So if you want to receive some kind of payment, uh, the government said, or the welfare organization says, you have to sell ice cream on this corner from this time to this time. We don't care if you sell a single cone of ice cream, but you have to be there from this time to that time if you want your check. Uh, the people there are highly educated and are very diligent uh, in their work, which was evident, by the way, in the congregation. I mean, you see them there. They take it very, very seriously, uh, the Lord's work and doing his will. On the left... Uh, is the Bible class teacher. Uh, he was about in his late 20s and uh, was a school teacher. Um, I think he actually teaches English, if I remember correctly. And his lesson was on how to study the Bible. And it was very interesting, uh, given his academic knowledge and the way he approaches academics and uh, translating his insights from approaching academia to approaching the Bible. And uh, I mean, he just made it so plain, and he made that statement. I mean, the Bible is so easy to understand if you actually care what's in it. If you begin to study and begin to truly want to know what God is telling us because of the Bible, it's so easy to understand, and it's so rich and filled with blessing. Uh, the center picture there is Hannah and I, of course, and then Martin, which, as you can tell, we're very excited to see. Uh, we knew him uh, in Durham. He's from Singapore, but he was attending Duke to become a medical doctor. Um, and so we would go pick him up and give him rides um, when he was in the Durham area. He's now a doctor, by the way. And he said he is ready to move on to another area of work within medicine. Uh, right now he's doing, I think, surgery. And he works about 30 hours uh, at a time. Not straight, but he's on call. Uh, and he said the government in Singapore, because they allow him to leave to uh, go to Duke, etc. cetera. Uh, he has, I think, five years that he has to give to uh, Singapore being a doctor before he can uh, look at another opportunity. Uh, and then on the very right there is Hannah. If you notice the size difference. Uh, let me tell you, walking through the airports and uh, walking around, um, it's, 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 it's interesting. You feel like a giant in some ways. Uh, the lady on the far left is Vietnamese. And she is um, in Singapore, but she goes to Vietnam from time to time to support the congregations that are dispersed uh, because of the episode in Ho Chi Minh. Um, and it was such a blessing to see uh, these folks and their love and care for souls uh, and the Lord and, and spreading the gospel throughout this region uh, and the world. Do they speak English there? I mean, Singapore? Let me tell you, Ira Rice, 
uh, who was kind of the trailblazer, if you will, in regards to a lot of the work going on in this region, uh, saw what was happening in Singapore as they were seeking independence from Malaysia back in the 60s. And <clears throat> when they gained their independence, <clears throat> Ira Rice uh, had been prepping and had a plan to go in and start spreading the gospel because he knew that Singapore was a region where English was spoken in that area, but yet it was a mixture of people from all over the world, mainly Asian regions. And they would come in, uh, and then they would a lot of times go back out. And so his thought was, if we can teach the gospel, English being one of the main languages, if not the majority language spoken, we can uh, help it spread in this region and uh, that's one of the reasons why the Four Seas Bible College is there. Uh, Peter Chin has attended the Memphis School of Preaching. Uh, he's from Malaysia. Um, but uh, his wife, I'll just mention this in the last comment here. Uh, his wife, uh, before she was baptized, was, um, uh, I think, Taoist and uh, ancestry worship and um, <clears throat> spoke uh, Malaysian and knew a little English um, as well, uh, and a preacher, um, a gospel preacher, had hired her as a secretary, put something in the paper, and she replied. And uh, she was helping him get his correspondence out just before email. Um, and uh, he was sending letters all over you know, that region, <clears throat> and he began <clears throat> having her write down scriptures. And he was giving her scriptures to write for her. And she started reading what these verses were saying, and uh, she would, you know, kind of look at it and say, it's got this name and then these numbers and a colon, and she was kind of confused by it. And she started reading the scriptures. Well, then the gospel preacher came up to her after she had been doing this for a while, and in Malaysian, uh, asked her for a Bible study. And she said that the fact that he asked her in her own language uh, showed her how much he was interested in her and cared about her because she knew he didn't really know that very well. And uh, she was uh, provoked and, and was willing to study um, and uh, ended up studying the Bible and, and becoming a Christian and is now Peter Chin's wife. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting. And, uh, uh, you know, these folks are... are um, very grateful for God's word and what a blessing it is that uh, it's right here in this book. God doesn't speak to us by whispers. He doesn't speak to us by some stranger on the street that comes to us and tells us something. Uh, he gives it to us right here. This is what we need to know. It's right here. And uh, these folks in this part of the world are very appreciative of it and hold it in high regard and are so thankful for it. And let me tell you, being over there and kind of just not being able to be with you, you brethren for a while, uh, it was great to, to see uh, their, their diligence and their uh, love for the Lord uh, and his kingdom. Are so, they allowed to have Bibles or are they all of them can you just buy one? Well, Vietnam, I don't know that answer. That's a good question. And I don't know. I know in China, for example, you can have uh, children's book Bibles where it's mainly illustrated with pictures. Uh, but the free print of the Bible uh, is not uh, authorized in China. So Vietnam, I don't know. Uh, again, the South is kind of you know, like the wild, wild west in some ways. They're kind of detached from the communist government. So even if they're not allowed, they may be doing it down there. I don't know. Uh, Singapore, yes. Singapore, absolutely. Um, That's what my uncle, where he used to, <coughs> my uncle that passed away, where he went to church. They, I thought they spoke a lot of English there because they had helped out in some ministries over there. Okay. And they, and that's how I knew a little sure. bit about it. So. Well, and, and to that point, as I mentioned before class, I mean, the work that's going on in Vietnam, I don't know of any other way to even get in contact with that work other than through the Lim Ha Pin Road Congregation or the Four Seas Bible College. Um, and I'm very intrigued by that work because they're not freely allowed to worship. I mean, just that's just mind-boggling. Uh, and so if you're interested in supporting that work or any of the other works, they have missionaries, by the way, all over uh, Southeast Asia. Um, or uh, even interested in maybe supporting the Bible school, the Four Seas Bible College, uh, you can let me know and I can put you in contact with Peter Chin, who would probably be able to uh, 
uh, help you figure out how to direct uh, the funds and, and how to get it there. So, anyway. Eat some different food? We did. <laughs> I, we both actually were very open to it and didn't mind it at all. But I will say, by the fifth, sixth, seventh day, we were, we were kind of saying to ourselves, I'm just, you know, I'll take anything that's just a burger at this point. <laughs> just, I want some barbecue or something, you know. Uh, but uh, I, I improved on my chopstick skills a little bit. <laughs> we enjoyed it. Were you amazed at the number of dedicated people in the other religious, like the temples? Oh, the yeah. Is it, isn't it amazing how many people Absolutely. are in there? Sure. That, you can tell clearly aren't your tourists, right? The locals that right. are there and they're coming to pay their right, pay their yes. respects and right. pay their money and right. to pray and right. to. Well, and, and that's it is just it is it, insane. that's the one thing that it, right. just amazed me when I traveled over in that area and, right. and lived over there on and off for several years that it was just amazing to watch all those people. Sure, very devoted. Exactly. And 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 what's sad is. We can pray to our Lord and, you know, assemble freely in this country uh, whenever we want. And we sometimes struggle with that. Um, and yet the brethren there are not necessarily able to, especially in the Vietnam area. And then from your perspective, what you're describing, those who don't uh, seek the one true and only living God but seek idolatry are constantly... There. updating their yep. idols in the front of their bus and car and boat and offering incense and offering prayers. And a lot of it's ritualistic. Now, understand, they're not truly, you know, being mindful. When you're saying Buddha 10,000 times in a row, there, I mean, there's, you're not, I mean, it's like our Lord tells us, you, you know, God, although they're not even praying to the one true and one living God, doesn't hear us for our many words. So it's not even very mindful in what they're doing. But they're devoted into their lack of money. It was kind of like when we studied Islam, remember? Uh, <clears throat> here's this lack of consistency and uh, logic and um, a lot of in, you know, inhumane things that are just clearly contradictory to love and just clear biblical teachings. Um, but yet they're devoted to it. Uh, yes. So uh, I think we can learn something from that, really, in a lot of ways, right? Well, thank you all very much. Really uh, enjoyed it. And... Uh, Appreciate your prayers, and it's great to be home. <laughs>